Thank you, Katya. Um, and congratulations again, uh, Stephen and Yuren on the book. I'm uh, really happy to be here uh, as part of this celebration. Um, I'm gonna just do a brief bios of uh, Stephen and Yearn, um, just to get all their many accomplishments um, in our minds. Um, Stephen Levine served for 29 years as president of the California Institute of the Arts, stepping down in 2017. Shortly thereafter, he became founding director of the Thomas Mann House in Los Angeles, and he currently chairs the advisory board. Before coming to CalArts, Stephen had served as an assistant professor of English and American literature at the University of Michigan from 1974 to 81, and as assistant and then associate director of arts and humanities at the Rockefeller Foundation uh, from 1981 to 88. Stephen has been an active contributor to the Los Angeles and national cultural and educational communities for many years, serving at various times on the boards of the American Council on Education, the American Council on the Arts, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the operating company of the Los Angeles Music Center, KCRW FM Public Radio, KCET Public Television, the Idlewood Arts Academy, the Villa Aurora Foundation for European American Relations, and the visiting committee of the J. Paul Getty Museum. In addition to the Thomas Mann House, he currently serves on the board of the Guggenheim Foundation, the American University in Rome, the Kotzen Foundation for the Art of Teaching, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. So Stephen, there's no signs of slowing down yet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jörn Jakob Rover is an uh, award-winning writer known for merging elements of literature and journalism in his essays at CalArts. We love hybrid writing of this nature. Um, and his lengthy uh, profile conversations with luminaries from the arts, science and society have been collected in a book of nearly 900 pages, which was published by Salas in 2014 and is currently in English translation. Um, Jörn is the author of seven books, including Reflections on a Soul, on the photographic artworks of Dale Grant and Verushka Meinleben, a conversation-based biography of German artist Vera Countess Lendorf. Um, so I'd actually like to start uh, by asking uh, you both a question um, about process, sort of how you generated the book. Um, and, uh, I think you could describe it as a conversation-based biography. Um, and you're, this is a form that you've kind of developed. Um, and I found it really interesting. Uh, it was kind of a mix of um, personal essay, interview, journalism. There was some hist historiography in there. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this kind of form and this process how you maybe used it in other contexts and then sort of how it all played out with Stephen. Um, well, I've been doing this kind of work, this very um, particular focus for 30 years now. Um, I, uh, I started um, um, in the late 80s already um, conducting conversations with uh, um, German Jews. Uh, because by that time there was not so much knowledge um, about the, um, the period uh, after the war and um, there were no, I didn't have any Jewish neighbors, um, um, but the theme was sort of in the air and so I actually wanted to meet people and I made that happen and so I met with Berlin, basically with Berlin Jews um, between the age of 20 and 95. And that's how I started uh, doing conversations. Um, and after I postgraduated, I picked up my work as, an, as a journalist um, because uh, during my studies, I had already written for quite a number of publications, magazines, newspapers. And um, I was encouraged to continue with this kind of work because people thought it was interesting, they liked it, it was readable and it was informative. And since then I have developed this form to my own, um, well, it's, it's my own approach, which is basically 
uh, it's not interviews, but it's conversations, because I regard interviews as a source that is based basically on information and uh, an exchange of information, whereas in a conversation um, you have more space for um, for the thought and um, for the reader it should be possible to read between the lines. So a conversation is much more broad um, and, and uh, lengthy but it also um, needs um, a great deal of research, a great deal of um, preparation, and in the later process, re-editing. So in the course of this book, I worked, um, I think for a couple of months preparing everything, and I worked about a year to edit and re-edit and shape the book in the way um, you can read it now. Um, Stephen and I had been known each other for many years. Uh, it was Janet, Janet Sternberg, his wife, um, a wonderful artist, writer and photographer, who I had originally met because I was asked, would I be interested to have a look, take a look at her writing and her uh, artistic work? And I said, yes, I would. And it turned out out to be magnificent work and so we met in Berlin and we got actually we got friends well, we became friends immediately and that, it was in that uh, curse that um, I came to meet Stephen and we slowly developed uh, our friendship uh, but it was through the conversations that we got um, I would say really very close because uh, it took, took us about a month to go through all my questions uh, when I was in Los Angeles. Well, and um, the result you have here, hopefully in your hands, everybody. And uh, you're going to tell us how you like it and what you think about it. Mm -hmm. So I hope this at least partly answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you can tell the great care you took with it. Um, Stephen, I don't, I don't know if you want to say anything about how the process was for you. I'll just say that I, I, I did not go in this, into this anxious to talk about myself. Um, and Jorn's carefully prepared research and, and questions that framed the conversation got me to look at aspects of my own life that I never would have looked at independently. And then as he framed the whole book, which is really is framed as a, as a novel almost, it has a, a, a through arc. Um, I discovered things about myself I didn't know. So this, this felt like a real gift at the end of the day. Although again, I'd gone into it sort of kicking and screaming. Uh, it was really Janet who wanted to see it happen. <laughs> well, I it's been... I... yeah, go ahead. I remember that in the beginning, Stephen was still quite restrained and um, I'm used to that. I'm used to people being a little, well, refrain, restrained or even frightened what's this going to be like uh what's he gonna ask what does he want to know um is this going to be tricky and uh, are these questions are go going to be too leading mm -hmm. and um if i may say so he he softened up and he opened up more and more uh with each day that we came together and there were moments that were very intense because it seemed like Stephen would sort of really enter his past. Um, maybe we're going to talk about it uh, a little more at a later point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, of this conversation. But um, I enjoyed it very much. It was a lot of work. Um, it looks very easy, which is what it's what it's supposed to 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 do. Mm -hmm. um, but um. Very happy I did it. Great, thank you. Um, I, I mean, I think the, the form of the book is, is definitely something that recommends it to readers. Um, I also wanted to flag a few things that I think are gonna be of great interest to people uh, in sort of arts and education at, at, the, at this moment um, that, you, uh, that you two delved into um, in your conversations. Um, 
I think it's a, a, a great interest, uh, Stephen, partly because of the sheer number and varied nature of the challenges that you faced, um, particularly while you were heading CalArts, and then also because of your honest, straightforward appraisal of how you did. And I think um, uh, Yaron has a role in that as well, because I, I like the directness of your, of your conversation. Um, but two of the challenges that stood out to me as sort of particularly germane in our current moment, uh, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, uh, and also sort of how they relate to today's challenges, um, were your efforts on behalf of racial diversity, both at the Rockefeller Foundation and at CalArts, and then your stewardship of the Institute uh, after the 94 Northridge earthquake. So I wondered if we could talk first about your efforts in diversity, um, equity, and inclusion. Because you know we know these issues um, and just the issue of social justice um, in higher ed settings uh, has recently received a lot of attention as kind of one of the responses to the George Floyd protests, um, which have sort of reopened, I think, our social imagination uh, in terms of what we can do as a country, how we can be better. Um, but of course, it's not a new challenge, is it? Um, and I, I, I think people will be interested in hearing sort of the work you've done on it and sort of your thoughts about that. I, I, my father was um, a small town doctor uh, who felt that most of his patients uh, were not really ill with anything organic, that they were suffering their lives. Um, and I grew up with a st strong sense through him that we are all sort of coping with pretty much the same things. Obviously different economic circum, I've, I've read enough <laughs> Marxist theory to understand that that's, that could be quite naively put, um, but still we, we have our lives to, to put together. Uh, my mother was a, trained to be a concert pianist, uh, but didn't have the confidence or the financial backing. So grew up unhappy uh, that she was unable to have the life she wanted to have. So I think deeply embedded in me was that we all should have, we all were pretty much the same um, in, in, in human value. Uh, and we all had something to contribute. And the you issue- always, And you always called it, the, you were always talking about the community of shared suffering. That's a, that's a phrase I got from Janet, and it's uh, or that's not quite the way she put it, but very close to that. Uh, but that's in our common humanity. Um, so I grew up with a strong sense that I, uh, that equal opportunity was what it was about, um, and I had I grew up solidly middle class. I had every opportunity, um, and was aware that I did, um, and more and more aware as I went forward. Uh, so given an opportunity uh, 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 at the Rockefeller Foundation uh, to deal with uh, how we presented the, the art of then what we would we, we called ethnic and minority cultures, uh, but cultures coming out of traditions that were not perfectly aligned with sort of Main Street American art. Uh, so we started a program which I ran um, supporting curators to uh, both collaborate with community and uh, to explore ways that the museum could express art from the inside. Um, one of the examples, I don't know, if, I don't think comes up in the book is uh, an exhibition of American Indian uh, art that um, ignored the fact that the rattles used in dance were held upright and was displaying them pointed down. Uh, and just miss the fact that these were musical instruments in part, and there was there was a way they operated. Anyway, I shouldn't go on so long. Um, uh, Cal Arts, when I arrived, was very heavily a white institution. Uh, it seemed to me that if we were going to, and it was an important institution already. So uh, I would say one of the one of the obstacles uh, for every, uh, or at least at Cal Arts, was the institution was very proud of what it already was. Uh, when I arrived, it had good reason to be. Uh, but it seemed clear to me that unless we could uh, find ways to open it to a much broader range of who lived uh, first in the United States and then eventually in the world, but the United States first, uh, that we wouldn't matter in the long run. We wouldn't be contributing uh, what we had in us to contribute. Um, 
And so we, the very first program we started was a youth program uh, called the Community Arts Partnership, which eventually had a third of all our students going out to teach in an underserved neighborhood of Los Angeles one day a week. Um, I saw it as a, as a, a double thing that they had, they were ex as predominantly white middle-class kids um, were being exposed to more of the social facts of life. Um, and that the younger kids uh, were, were receiving the message. And I, didn't, was, I didn't care about these kids becoming artists. I wanted them to recognize that they had something valuable to contribute. And art is one of the ways you can discover, uh, since you make it in large measure from yourself, uh, that you have something to contribute. So that, that really became the, the through line of, I guess, of my whole life. Um, and certainly of my work at CalArts. You asked a second part of the question, which I don't think I addressed. Um, um, well, I, you know, I, I was just thinking, I just wanted to say about CAP, it has certainly also served as a pipeline for uh, BIPOC students to come to CalArts um, over the years, which has been terrific and is a way of countering kind of the arguments that, um, well, uh, sort of, we just can't find the students, right? Because they were there and they, and they went through this program, um, which I've also taught in. Um, and, uh, uh, and that was that, you know, that that's really kind of, um, as you said, sort of uh, helped to uh, change the profile of the school um, and build the profile of the school. In the archives, I've come across uh, annual reports where you also talked about um, from the 90s, um, uh, faculty hiring. Um, and, and your efforts uh, in that area, which can be kind of, it can be more challenging, I think. Um, uh, but I, I guess overall sort of, do you have thoughts? It was sort of how kind of how you could, um, uh, what advice you might have for presidents today? Sort of what is the role of the president in, in trying to change the culture of the Institute um, in decolonizing it, uh, we could say, or at the very least building up its social justice mission, if you have thoughts on that, yeah. Yeah, um, my, my framing thought is really that it's slow and patient work. Uh, that right now, as a response to the Black Lives Matter protests, we have people making sort of strong gestures. We're gonna hire a diversity coordinator. We're gonna do X, but that's, that's all fine. It's good, you gotta start someplace. Um, but th this is sort of patient, careful, day after day, uh, whatever the subject matter is at hand, you think about how it relates to this, this larger thing you're trying to accomplish. Um, and I think it takes the president to do it because um, in a way, everybody else in the Institute is totally absorbed with getting their job done. Uh, whether it's on the staff side or on the, on the faculty side, uh, they've got to teach the classes, they've got to work, the financial people have to worry about the budget. In some ways, the president and the provost are the two people who have the freedom uh, to really keep their eyes on uh, a broader sense of possibility. Um, so I do think that leadership is, is absolutely essential. Um, I think the second part of it is to listen. Um, I remember a day which uh, I was told in the music school that uh, they often would, there'd be two violinists, say, uh, auditioning and one had something interesting to say about their lives, but didn't have great chops. And the other had more, had more training and more skills. Uh, and they chose the person who had something more interesting to contribute. And that, when you think about diversity, is, is a huge opening. That whole idea that you're not just going to reward people for their previous opportunity, how many years of lessons they had before coming to your institution, but you're going to, you're, 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 you're recognizing what they have to, to contribute uh, from the lives they've led. And I think once you can get a substantial number of faculty to think in those terms, uh, then it's just obvious that um, you, you, want, you want a range of people with a range of different backgrounds and that there's great benefit to have a lot of those people who didn't have well-protected middle-class lives uh, that have lived through a lot of what's wrong with our society uh, and that that can only make the institution a better institution. Uh, 
because give people with something to contribute to the conversation. There's, there's, if I may add something, a third dimension that I've learned of, um, of what makes a good president of such an institution. And Stephen gives this example in the book without actually uh, naming it so. When CalArts fell into ruins um, after the Northridge earthquake in uh, 1996, um, Stephen and uh, two of his secretaries were cleaning one of the offices. And everybody was, all of them were sort of sweeping the floor, um, picking up um, well, bottles and everything that had fallen down. And uh, Stephen describes it in his book for one moment, he was looking up and um, he said to his colleagues, what are we actually doing here? And they respond, well, we are being good workers. And um, then Stephen in the book says how much he values for people being good workers. And I think he's a, an excellent worker. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in that. It goes with, it goes with feeling that we, we all are, I mean, we're on a scale of skills or whatnot, but there are very few people who have something totally exceptional to contribute that separates them. I mean, Einstein, there are people who, say, who are separate from the rest of humankind by some special gift, although he kept himself not separate, which is remarkable. Um, uh, that the difference to me is open uh, and all, well, let me say another, I, I think Silicon Valley has taught us that all it takes is a good idea. Um, and I think that's a corrupting idea that all it takes is a good idea. Um, what we want is good realities. Uh, and that, that means settling in and just doing the work. Um, I think in this, in this world where people change uh, at least higher education, the average college president lasts five or six years at this point, um, I think people go on to the next job before they've even learned what their institution is capable of. Uh, they've made some contribution that they can make. And then on the basis of that, you go on to the next opportunity. Uh, whereas what your institution is capable of is that, that's deep knowledge that takes time to acquire. Um, I, I learned a lot of it in the Northridge earthquake, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, when a faculty up against Terrible, I mean, no, no campus anymore. Um, having to improvise how they taught, not unlike the situation every college is facing right now. Mm -hmm. um, faculty were determined to do it. Um, and you just saw what, what dedication meant, that they were not gonna leave their students in the lurch, um, that they were gonna find a way. Uh, I remember the, at the, the day after, a couple days after the earthquake, we, when we'd lost all our facilities, all we had was 12 party tents out front. And each school put their best teacher, I mean, most compelling, um, in the tent and was teaching the whole, the whole school while the others tried to figure out where are we gonna go? How are we gonna, what's our curriculum gonna be? Well, that wasn't something that the provost or I came up with as a, I mean, we came up with the fact that we better get some tents because you couldn't do this outdoors. Um, but that was entirely the faculty just sort of seizing, uh, seizing control. Um, so yeah, yeah. It, it, it taught me just what, what amazing people had, had, were at CalArts. Yeah, I was interested. One of the things you said is that um, CalArts is so decentralized as you perceived it. Um, and that that was a challenge in regular times perhaps for you, but in the context of the earthquake, it was it was a real strain. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, there, there, if if we were were highly centralized in trying to tell each school how they should deliver their their curriculum, now that we we would have been dealing with sort of cliched ideas about what curriculum ought to be, uh, just sort of things that came ready to hand. Here, uh, the the faculty. Um, who really had to, they were the ones who saw whether it was working or not, um, were free in a way in each school to, uh, to figure out how to go on. Remember when we moved the art school, uh, moved into a disused um, Lockheed facility, 
uh, north, about 15 miles north of campus. And suddenly the artists were in studios with, they still got people private studios with combination locks on the doors because this had been secret research. And Tom Lawson, the Dean said how great this was that where your studio was uh, affected how you, what kind of art you made. Uh, that interesting things would come out of the fact that people suddenly were in a radically different situation. Well, I would not have come to that. I would have thought of everything as a sort of poor substitute for the, stu the, the studios we'd spent so much money trying to build on campus. Um, uh, and each school had, had insights like that. Um, so yes, I, I think this, this sort of centralization is conducted in the sort of name of efficiency. Uh, but when efficiency is your goal, uh, I think you end up doing away with all sorts of human subtlety. Uh, and you're efficient, but at a much lower level of, of accomplishment at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm reminded of the Oscar Wilde a quote, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, but I think probably, you know, CalArts has this long history of kind of experimental and radical uh, pedagogy and the idea that it's an artist, it's an environment created for artists by other artists. So it's wonderful to hear these stories about kind of how faculty sort of um, uh, arose to the occasion um, and actually worked with those constraints to do something creative and, and also to keep the school going and we should acknowledge of course all the work that you did um, to kind of uh, put us back on a, a sound footing I mean we we'd suffered a 35 million dollar kind of um, a blow uh, in terms of the facilities uh, and all of that and um, and all of that is kind of detailed in the book and um, I, I you know I recommend it to anyone yes dealing with the kind of um, crises we're dealing with today with the, the impact of, uh, of COVID and what's hopefully the aftermath um, of COVID. Um, I wanted to, to now kind of shift gears a little bit um, to, to, to talk about your kind of background, your personal background um, I, and how it relates to sort of the, the life path um, you've taken um, I think one of the strengths of, of Yearn's approach is um, his insistence that you relate your own autobiography and even your feelings, right, to um, decisions that you've made professionally and also just your relationship to arts and culture in general. Um, and I was really interested by sort of how you grew up in the Midwest in a little town called Melrose, Wisconsin what your mom, as you have already mentioned, uh, wanted to be a, a concert pianist, uh, worked to try to make that happen. Life got in the way, as it often does, uh, particularly for, for mothers of three. Um, and uh, um, sort of the frustration she felt, how that may have affected your relationship to the arts, also feeling like you were kind of out of touch with the arts, the centers of arts and culture, which were the, at that point sort of you, you perceived as New York and, and Europe. Um, so I, I wonder if you can do a little bit of kind of unpacking for us about your background and how that related to your decision to get into the arts. I think it related to your choice of a, of a soulmate in Janet, um, who are, is herself an artist. So any thoughts you have on that um, and also Yaren, I'm sure you have thoughts as well. No, th this is an area where uh, Yorn's uh, careful preparation uh, turned out to be a real gift. Uh, I, I had a sense of how much I owed to my father's sense of our, our shared being and my mother's frustration at not being able to, how they shaped my life. But I'd, I hadn't thought about uh, the inheritance from my grandparents, uh, the, the immigrant generation. Uh, Jews who wanted in the worst way to be accepted as equals in the societies in which they lived. Um, and sometimes briefly believed it was possible uh, if they assimilated enough. Uh, and then always discovered the end that it was not quite possible. Um, and then came to, came to the United States in desperation really. Um, uh, and I think carried with them this, this idea of 
uh, of inclusion. I think it's, it's not an accident that Jews were active in the civil rights movement. They, un they understood that once you don't have equality for everyone, you're on the road to equality for no one. Um, so so Jorn's, Jorn's sort of interested history and development uh, really, really fed into that. Um, Melrose felt like it was the end of the world. And later we moved to a town called Superior, which was in way northern Wisconsin, which felt like you were living on a glacier. Um, William Dean Howells said the difference between a Russian writer and an American one is that a Russian writer could be sent to Siberia, but no American writer would ever be condemned to the perils of a winter in Duluth. Duluth was right. <laughs> um, I had these little moments. Uh, first hearing uh, Bob Dylan's music uh, played to by one of his uncles to make fun of it uh, when, it, when, it, when it was on his second, second album. Um, seeing at our local teacher's college, uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour, uh, the Elaine Rene film, which I didn't understand, but I felt like it was, the same way Bob Dylan felt like it was the truth, even though I wasn't sure what that truth was, um, Hiroshima Mon Amour felt like the truth, although I couldn't, I couldn't have told you what that, what that truth was. So, so my mother's aspirations, um, these glimpses that through the arts, uh, you maybe could arrive at the truth of the present, um, sort of got pinned to college is when I'm gonna make my escape um, and enter the world. I remember when I arrived at the Stanford campus to realize it was not in San Francisco, which you could not tell from the recruiting bulletin, uh, um, and that I was in this suburb on a what seemed like almost a plantation or a resort. I just broke down in tears that I that this uh, that I had great teachers. So this is not against Stanford, uh, but um, and then my my life was sort of uh, in search of finding the present. Um, uh, in graduate school, I sort of went about it in a strange way. I thought I could never understand the present. So I'd study the 18th century. And maybe if I took a long running head leap, uh, I, I could eventually make my way uh, through the 18th century to the 20th century, uh, which in fact turned out to be largely true, um, uh, though not exactly in the form that I originally thought. Um, but some, I, I think, Stephen, in what was also important for, for you was um, it, it was a coming of age in a way that you were a very, originally a very lonely boy. And you, um, and you sort of sheltered yourself with books and uh, you dived into the world of books and fantasy in order to not communicate with others. And since then, your life was very much about communicating with others in the world. It is, it in a way was a coming out, a coming out of the shell in which you, in which you were born in. No, I think it's also very important for your background and for for the man you are today. No, it, it took a long time. Uh, in a way, I was hiding from my mother's unhappiness. I always felt it was my responsibility to cheer her up. And I always failed it. I mean, I, my sisters tell me that I, I was the only one who could cheer her up, but obviously it was very temporary because her life was not the life she had hoped to have. Um, so um, but human, human, direct human emotion often felt like it, it was exposing yourself to pain and suffering. Um, and I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. Um, in fact, I was sure I didn't want to do that. Uh, one of the great gifts of being married to Janet Sternberg, my wife, um, is that her art and her life is all about being totally open to the, uh, the depth of the experience around you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not really answering your question now, excuse me. This no, I think, I think you are. It's, it's, it's hard to this, summarize this, a life, right, in this, yeah. This is the challenge you're faced. I tended to sort of swerve off into complicated other directions. Um, but we I, always return to the red line. I, I, would, I, I would say there was one other component, which is um, I was always interested in the way the world worked. This is not something we talked about particularly in the book, 
uh, just how the world's work, how, how anything good actually happened. And I saw local examples and things my father did. I saw it as the sort of the way individuals could do good things. I, I always wondered how the society could do something good. Um, and uh, the foundation and then CalArts uh, were, were wonderful exposures to how that gets done. And were sort of fascinating in their own right, uh, process-wise about uh, how you listen, how, how you are inclusive, how you, how you put something in place that has a chance of lasting for a while. Um, all of it was, was learning. Um, and actually the, the, the work I'm doing now with the Thomas Mann House, in, in, which is really about uh, the future of liberal democracy in Europe and the United States, which gets you into issues of political economy, um, and uh, social and political history um, make, in a way it's an opening into the further, the further unraveling of how things get done. Uh, the, the way things outside the local end up shaping what, what is possible uh, at the level of the local. Um, and when I then look back now at what I did at Rockefeller and CalArts, I, I, I realized this is something Jorn helped me see that in some ways, what I always had been concerned with is that we make a more perfect union uh, as, uh, um, as Obama and John Lewis said, that we, we realize the possibilities of what the United States set out to try to, well, some question what it set out to do, but certainly built into the constitution was, was trying to get somewhere more positive. Um, so it, it, it feels like it's been a very logical development to take it to this, this larger sphere. Right. I think, I think probably particularly coming from an institution um, like CalArts, um, sort of this question of, of what is the relationship of the arts to society, which you kind of flagged, or sort of how can we make a better society, and also of art schools, because in, the, in its very first year, CalArts was uh, sort of invited to guest edit a journal of, uh, uh, called Arts and Society. And they took up the whole issue with documents having to do with the founding of CalArts, just administrative memos, uh, student applications, et cetera, et cetera. But it was no ordinary institution, right? So they're actually kind of uh, very, very interesting. Um, it was this wildly experimental art school. And its task, as the first provost said, was they saw it as putting the whole cracked world back together again. Um, and I, I, I'm just interested in your thoughts on what the role of arts is in, in kind of that um, endeavor, but also particularly art schools. Well, uh, I guess I'd say two things. One, I, I think that the, the great possibility of the arts is uh, it can take what you already know and imagine uh, what follows from that um, in a way that s scholars are really good at, uh, at, at describing what is. Uh, they're not on the whole train to think about what might be. Um, some, some move in that direction and I hope more and more are, are certainly more and more started to in response to Trump. Um, but um, the arts, in a way, it's part of the mandate of the arts uh, to, to go beyond uh, what, is, what is easily knowable. Um, I think the challenge in art school, I mean, historically, uh, if, if you take uh, Col de Beaux-Arts, uh, it was not concerned with content. In a way, you spent your whole career uh, working on your craft. Um, and then afterward, you found out whether you actually had anything to contribute. And mostly you found out you didn't have anything to contribute. Um, uh, and many people who really did have something to contribute, uh, people like Matisse discovered they couldn't go to regular art school, that it just, it, it was no use, use for them. Well, I think a lot, of, a lot of music schools have been that kind, they're about, they're in, including into the present, although it's changing pretty rapidly now. Um, uh, let's just work on your chops uh, and the rest will follow from there. What, what I, I think the job of art school is, is in some ways the opposite. Uh, you have your whole life to work on your chops. Um, 
it's to help you gain the confidence to ask hard questions um, and the will, um, the, the, the will and the ambition to go at the biggest things uh, in a disciplined way, or sometimes in not in such a disciplined way. Um, in some ways, that's where the title of the book comes from. Uh, the failure is what it's all about. Uh, um, what, what a career it is to be an artist. Uh, spend your whole life sort of not quite realizing what you meant to realize, and then going on to the next work and the next work. I think of John Baldessari, who was hired to teach painting at CalArts, and before he arrived, had burnt all his paintings, decided that was not the direction at all. And then having changed to text and image uh, and photo photographs primarily, uh, became radically successful teacher of, of two generations of, of CalArts graduates. Um, I, I, I think one of the challenges, I mean, we all resist failure, it's no fun. Um, is to encourage students in the belief that uh, unless they're failing, they're not doing something right. <laughs> they're not aiming high enough uh, if they haven't taken on something hard enough that they could fail at it. And that, and that that's nothing to be ashamed of, that's something to be proud of, uh, but you don't stop there. Then you, then you go back and you say, well, now, how did I fail this time? Uh, and that's, that is the process. Um, I, th I think it's pro and it's especially hard, I think, in some of the some of the performing arts fields where uh, the failure is not what you made. Uh, someone turns you down at an audition and you're being told that you're a failure uh, to prepare students to just live apart from that, uh, to recognize that's the problem of the person who's doing the auditioning. Uh, your your challenge is to f is to find your path and keep going toward it. Um, and I think, one of, to me, one of the great glories of CalArts um, is that it does not stop pushing in that direction. Um, and it doesn't just happen in class, that, that in a way what happens outside of class is just as important as, in fact, you can't, hard to tell whether someone's in class or out of class, everyone's working so much. <laughs> you were just, Stephen, you were just talking about uh, the title of the book. The subtitle is, um, a life devoted to leadership in the arts. Um, and um, I think that is precisely, uh, apart from the fact that we are friends, Stephen and I, uh, the reason why I wanted to do this book um, or why I agreed to do this book when I was asked. Um, having met so many um, people or even luminaries in the arts over, over decades, I was very interested um, in learning how someone who would sort of act in the shadow of the arts, uh, of the artists um, actually ticks. And it's usually that, that we are applauding the, art, the, the artists, but that we don't recognize who stands behind them and who actually makes them, who helps them become artists and who f facilitate their careers. Very seldomly or rarely is are they out there in the spotlight. So I sort of wanted to put Stephen in the, in the spotlight. I wanted to know what he thinks and feels and uh, who this man is, who has actually contributed next to all the deans and all the faculty members, contributed to many careers of artists. No, it's uh, again, I, I suppose somewhere buried deep in here is my mother's aspirations and my growing up being told that that was the greatest of all things. And my father, who was not a museum person, uh, loved the portraits of Rembrandt because he felt it revealed uh, people in their depth. Um, I, I was sort of raised to think the arts um, really did matter in a big way. Um, uh, I remember when I first met Janet, when I, who, who was so, so gifted, um, when I'd walk in the street with her, I'd, I'd feel like there was a spotlight on her. And I was sort of right in the shadow at the edge of that spotlight because she was just so gifted as an artist. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the pleasures um, 
of this is being actually becoming friends with artists and discovering they're just human beings at the end of the day. Uh, I think I went into this with some something. They said, well, they're not just human beings. They are something more, but still that they are also human beings uh, is, a, is a very important lesson. Yeah, I am. Um... I know that uh, people who are on the CAA uh, schedule will will um, will have to be leaving us at this point, um, but we might just talk for a little bit more. I just wanted to make sure you all um, uh, got to say everything um, that that you were hoping to say. Um, I wanted to follow up on that, um, Stephen. Uh, it in terms of being around artists um, and what kind of people there they are. Uh, it caught my eye when you described yourself as having more conservative taste in art than the institution you helmed, right? And that probably would have been true of any president, <laughs> uh, given that the institution was CalArts. <laughs> um, but I'm thinking of that uh, of that photo that uh, Yearn selected of CalArts graduation, which is kind of legendary, um, but where a, a naked young man wrapped in a python is approaching you on stage. Um, and, and you look pretty anxious, um, but uh, Yern, you chose fantastic photos, uh, archival um, uh, footage or, or photos for, uh, for the book from the CalArts archive and also from Stephen's personal um, archive. But I, I just wondered if you wanted to, um, if you had any thoughts on that photo, CalArts graduation over the years, which I'm sure was just a trial by fire. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then, yeah, Yaren, if you if if you have thoughts on um, how you chose the photos and 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 what the kind of role of this great um, archive is in the book, yeah. Well, there's actually one photo I, I I must say I find most fascinating. That is the photo taken around 1900. Uh, um, it's a family photos displaying ancestors of Stephen's family when they were still uh, living in Europe and when they were part of uh, the Jewish community in Vilnius. Um, this is really a sort of um, like you're in a time machine when you look at this photo, all those uh, women and men neatly dressed uh, with not a good lighting and their face is so stern. You will look at them and you wonder uh, where are they? lives actually in that very moment when the photograph is taken and um, where are they going to and uh, they probably would never have guessed that one of the, one of their upsprings Stephen would you know land in America one day and uh, sit here in front of the screen today um, so that is a photo I, I really love um, then there's another photo that I like which is um, uh, I think it's a graduation photograph taken in the, in the mid 70s of numerous of CalArts students, um, probably 100 of them uh, gathered in the hallway, very hippie-esque, very happy, very free. It's very expressive and it, it, it tells you a lot about the institution. Um, and it's already a photo displaying a bit of diversity um, amongst the students, which I liked. So these photos, I think, are, are quite remarkable. Uh, it's thanks to uh, graduate students from CalArts that they all were, actually most of them were being found in the archives. Uh, I'm very grateful to Christina Niasian for having helped me with that. Um, there were very few uh, photos of, um, of Stephen's life, I mean, of, 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 of his early life. Um, what, what, what would you say, Stephen, um, which are the photos you find compelling or interesting or meaningful? For, for, for me, the, I, I would say the three most compelling photos are first the cover photo, um, which is uh, when I was in camp and playing baseball at a time when I saw double and so trying to hit a ball was just hopeless. Um, and there, there was, I, I just looked at it, I, I felt some sympathy for that little boy uh, trying to be a good sport and play along even though he was dealing with a very big disadvantage when it came uh, to hitting a ball. 
um, uh, there's a photograph of my mother in it, um, which I feel almost like gives her a second life. Um, th this uh, sitting by the piano. Yeah, you know, one of the pleasures of this process was these these moments that just sent chills down my spine when you realized how critical these things from one's past uh, just they had made you and that these were, these were living people who had complicated lives aren't just part of your story they're they're their story and you're part of theirs uh, and then the boa constrictor I, well there's i have to say this for there's one of just janet and me next to each other in which she just looks so beautiful and we both look so intent and she was my partner in everything we did so seeing us together in the photograph was gratifying um, and then the boa constrictor yes because uh, i'm terrified of snakes uh, and the provost had gone out into the into the uh, audience, as it were, graduation, and asked the student, "Could he leave his boa constrictor behind when he came to?" Because she thought I would faint. Um, and he said, "Well, no, I couldn't do that. Then I'd be naked." Um, so he came up with the with, with his boa constrictor. And, uh, Beverly Neal, who was a blessing in my early years, she was provost of Cal Arts and knew much more about what was really going on than I did, um, uh, distracted me just enough as he, as he passed close to me <laughs> um, that it was all right. Uh, the, the bigger thing in all those early graduations is Calais was changing and there was always a fear we were growing, uh, trying to grow our way out of the, fine, the terrible deficits that we had historically run up. Um, and there was always the possibility of a protest at graduation. Um, and by the end, I'd learned to see that that's just life. That's, that's all right, protesting. But at the beginning, I, was, I thought about the parents and I just seemed like, oh, this would be just disastrous if everybody walks out or something awful happens. Um, I, th I think the turning point for me was uh, uh, a, a theater student had made a, appointment to see me and uh, my secretary, we, uh, Judy, whispered to me on the phone to me, he's brought a lot of friends, you should know. And I opened the door and the entire theater school walked into my office, uh, 180 people at that point, I think. And, and then um, we, we stood there for a while and then all but left one or two and they said, we just wanted you to understand what overcrowding feels like. Um, yeah. And you just have to learn that, pro that protest is about real things. I mean, it's just people trying to find a way to be heard uh, and that it's a, it's a really good thing. And, um, and you should be proud that your students are not afraid uh, to be in your face and, and to protest. I realize that's easier to say when you're no longer the president. <laughs> and not I, yeah. Actually, I really like Janet, that there, there's one thing, Janet, the one question I would like to play back to you, uh, Janet. Was there anything uh, about the book that, that was new to you that you found remarkable or um, extraordinary that the audience should know about? Um, well, I, from my perspective, uh, you know, Stephen was my boss and he was the president. And so I gained a lot of insight into him as a person. And that kind of helped me understand just like things over the course of, of history. Also the, um, just what he did with the earthquake, I wasn't there at the time. Um, uh, and that was, you know, that was really astounding. And then just, you know, kind of the wealth of um, not just effort, uh, but thought that he has put into um, what art schools are, um, what the arts um, uh, uh, mean and should do. Um, and also how frank he was about his own learning process. Um, yes. I thought uh, that was really impressive. And actually, I think we're gonna have to wrap up, but I did wanna say, Stephen, that faculty have been making comments um, in the chat um, who, uh, who were at CalArts with you. And um, Maureen Selward actually identified the boy wearing the Python. He was a student in experimental animation. Uh, his name is Patrick Spaulding. And she said she loved, she so loved the way you handled the earthquake and it's moving to think about. So there are other kind of tributes there in, in, the, um, oh, nice. in the chat. 
um, David Rosenboom and others. Um, so I, I, I do want to turn it back to Katya so she can show everyone the book. Um, but I, I really want to congratulate you both. Um, and it, it's, it's actually quite liberating to uh, moderate a panel. It's all called all, it's all about failures, the name of the book. And I, I feel like whatever I did was okay, but I hope I did justice to your project. And I encourage everybody um, uh, to read the book um, and look at the, the gorgeous archival photos. Um, and uh, let me turn it back over um, to, to Nicole, I think. Yeah, Janet, yeah. thank you, thank you. My pleasure. Oh. Yeah. Also from my side. Thank you very much, Janet. Of course. Yeah, I have also have to th say thank you to Janet, Jörn, and Stephen. What an enriching input. Um, there are no questions in the chat. So with regards to the, to the book, um, it does really exist. <laughs> <laughs> with linen and a desk jacket and if you would buy a copy after the session there will be an email susan coleman in the chat asks if the video is going to be available Gonna all all people who attended and are registered for this um, session will get will get an email and the link to the video is also inside the email so you can have afterwards a look to the video and it will be on the youtube page of our publisher so then I, I say thank you all for joining us today. Um, have a good rest of the day, wherever you are. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody listening and watching. Yes, thank you. Thank bye you. Bye.